Or number five, you can try to look for exceptions, what I call special niches, special people who who hopefully can produce a, a, a good return with safety in a low return world. But those people are truly exceptional and not easy to find. What inning do you see our current cycle being in and have we started a new game? First person to ask that question in this cycle. Uh, I haven't given it that much thought. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's unusually hard to, to, uh, to answer that question today. Uh, we normally think that the market has a certain ebb and flow and, uh, and that the cycles are, uh, they're different in detail. They're different in the duration, their amplitude, their speed. But, but that certain things uh, do tend to repeat from, from, or at least to rhyme, as Mark Twain said. Um, and, you know, normally what happens is that we have uh, an up cycle. We have increasing optimism, increasing risk tolerance, increasing good feelings because the up cycle is so rewarding and rising prices and eventual excesses of valuation. And, and, and the same thing through the economy. We have excessive expansion and excessive hiring and, and, and leverage and so forth. Then things uh, reverse and we get movement on the downside and we get uh, falling prices and uh, worse corporate results and, and deteriorating psychology and uh, the switch, switch from greed to fear. And, uh, and uh, we also get uh, economic deterioration. That's the normal cycle. And the it, it's a it's a matter of, I think the best way to think about the economic cycle and the market cycle, excesses and corrections, excesses and corrections, excesses and corrections. And uh, the a lot of the uh, changes are endogenous. They are within the economy and within the market. This is unique because this is exogenous. It's not it wasn't excesses of, of markets and economies. It was the pandemic. We had a recovery. It was a basically a healthy recovery. It was a slow, gradual recovery, the longest in history, but the slowest in post-war history, and, um, and and not too many excesses in the economy or even in the market. Uh, but then we had the pandemic, and the pandemic required us to close our economy in order to keep people apart and, and control the spread. And we had the worst quarter in the history. The second quarter it was down 30 percent on an annualized uh, basis. Um, so it's, it's very hard to say what, what inning we're in uh, because this is not a, a routine game, I guess I would say. Um, we are, we're at, at the beginning, we know we're only uh, about four months, five months into an economic recovery. We believe that recovery will, will last uh, at least as long as it takes to get the economy back to its 2019 level in terms of GDP. Um, there's some doubt now with the with the uh, failure of Washington to provide support payments. Uh, there's some doubt as to whether the recovery will live up to its ex everyone's expectations. But I think we are in a recovery. But, you know, an interesting question is we never had a, a, a normal recession. We had a an artificially induced recession. Are we still slated for a normal recession or has this uh, has the entire cycle been reset and uh, since it's only five months old, do we have years and years to go? I don't think anybody can say. Uh, and, you know, the extent to which the, uh, the Fed and the Treasury and the recovery rebuild people's liquidity and rebuild their uh, 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 willingness to consume um, and uh, to the extent to which uh, life returns to what it always has been is, is very uncertain. So uh, I, I uh, you know, I think we're at well, I think we're in the second inning vis-a-vis uh, -vis the economy. Of course, the market being at an all-time high, uh, despite the uh, negative fundamentals, uh, or, or, or I should say modest fundamentals, uh, that, that juxtaposition gives me more pause. And I would say that the rally in the market is in the sixth inning or the seventh inning. But, but uh, who's to say? If, if the economy is, is uh, salutary for the next uh, uh, five years on an uptrend, the market will do pretty well. Although I do think that the the recovery from the all-time lows uh, uh, in, in March has been very dramatic. And it feels to me, most of us, like the market is, is ahead of the economy. 
Yeah, Howard, uh, to, to follow up on that, um, it's been a, a extremely interesting and diverse recovery uh, across uh, styles and classes. One thing you read about in the memo is risk-adjusted return, uh, which of course, in some sense, leads us back to the academic notion of the sharp ratio. Of course, you can't eat the sharp ratio, right? right. Um, and you can't spend. About, and you can't spend the sharp ratio, right? We need to we need to require we need to require to return. There are there are a small number of ways to get there. Um, what, what's your view on the on, on on whether we're getting paid the right at, at the right level today? And I love how in the memo you bring in the capital market line, so it fits right into my lecture notes. So thank you for that. <laughs> That's a great one. But then, well, but then one thing about that is the dispersion across sectors, which is really unusual. Uh, with uh, growth and, and large cap stocks, for example, doing well, but there's still being uh, a, a large number of industries and sectors in deep distress. Well, that, um, Chris's reference to the capital market line. Uh, if you if you think about a graph with the uh, with return on the vertical axis and risk on the horizontal axis, we have a point uh, on the left side where the where at, at zero risk you have the risk free rate, and that's usually 30 day bills, which have no credit risk. And, and no inflation risk. And that's the lowest return you can get on anything. As you move up from that in risk, you there should be an increase in the expected return. People shouldn't invest in riskier assets if they're not expected to be higher returning than safe assets. So the line goes at an angle from the left, it goes up and to the right. Uh, we call that a positive correlation, a positive relationship between risk and expected return. Um, and uh, you know that's when and when 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 that line does go uh, up and to the right at a reasonable pace, we say the market's at equilibrium. And if 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 all the asset classes are on the line, we say they're at equilibrium because they're in a reasonable relationship to each other in terms of risk-adjusted return. As the risk rises, the return rises, and that's only right. It, nothing else would make sense. The problem today is that the, the, the Fed took that risk-free rate, which is here, it's the point from which all returns begin and emanate, and they pulled it down. And when you pull down the risk-free rate on the left-hand axis, the line also falls. Now, sometimes it falls not in parallel. Sometimes different parts of the line fall more than others. This, this, the slope could increase or decrease. That's the, the slope of the line is the, is the risk premium. Uh, and, uh, but the point is, I believe that uh, most asset classes uh, appear to be in equilibrium with each other. The, the risk-free rates appear to be uh, proportional. The returns appear to be proportional to the risk. But the problem is that all returns are at a very low level. And uh, as I said, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the pension fund uh, that needs seven has a hard time getting it today in stocks and bonds. Uh, and, um, and most of them have given up on that. And, and put substantial money into uh, alternative investments with their illiquidity and their manager reliance and so forth. Now, the, the great question that I usually end up speaking about is how do, you, how do you pursue a high return in a low return world? What should you do in a low return world? And there, I, I've come up with five possibilities and I can't think of any more. You can continue to invest as you always have and understand that you'll that the that the return you make will be lower than ever. You can worry about the level of asset prices, reduce your risk to to cushion the blow if a correction comes, but then your return will be lower still. You can go all the way to cash to the the ultimate preparation for a correction, but then your return will be zero. And you better be right fast because if you're in cash for two years and the market goes up, you may be looking for another job or new clients. Rather than risk reduction, you can go in the opposite direction. You can increase your risk in pursuit of a higher return. But is this the time to be increasing risk when there's great uncertainty in, in, as to the uh, fundamentals, geopolitical, political uncertainty, in addition to economic? Or number five, you can try to look for exceptions, what I call special niches, special people, who, who hopefully can produce a, a, a good return with safety in a low return world. But those people are truly exceptional and not easy to find. Yeah, uh, uh, truly, you know, alpha should be in some sense. Uh, That's right, rare. yes. Uh, 
It's hard to find. Uh, what's the, we've spoken together when you, we had been so lucky to uh, have you on campus about the use of leverage, and uh, in some cases you, you railed against it, in other cases maybe not. Uh, with low yields, uh, it might be tempting uh, to lever a portfolio. And of course, theory would say you can move along the capital market line either by adding capital structure to an investment, delevering or levering it up. Uh, what's your view as a practical matter about the use of leverage today? Well, uh, after the, I mean, the, the global financial crisis of 08 was really an, uh, uh, an, a demonstration of the effect of leverage because uh, uh, the world essentially had taken mo mainly mortgage-backed securities, but also loans to, to some extent, uh, uh, corporate loans, and put them into leveraged entities, structured leveraged entities, uh, CLOs, CDOs, RMBS, and so forth. And so what they did is they, they had internal leverage, which is to say that, that, that you could buy a highly levered piece at the bottom of the structure with an extremely high levered return, or you could buy the top of the structure where, where uh, you are not participating in the leverage with a low safe return over collateralized by the junior tranches. And uh, what happened is that, that, you know, when you leverage, you say, well, I, if this happens, I'll be great. If that happens, I'll still be okay. If this happens, I'll probably make it through. And the, the outcome in terms of defaults on mortgages was a multiple of the worst case that anybody had modeled. And after the global financial crisis, I put out a, a memo that entitled uh, leverage plus volatility equals dynamite. And, you know, a lot of, uh, there were thousands of defaults in mortgage-backed securities uh, because, uh, because of the over-leverage. Uh, and people should understand that leverage does not make any investments better. It magnifies the gains if you win and the losses if you lose. Um, and so, it, you know, it, I, think, I think that to make an investment better, you have to increase what I call the asymmetry. The goal in active investing should be to look for asymmetry, situations where if things go well, you'll make a lot of money, and if things go poorly, you won't lose a lot. And if you can find those, that's that's the holy grail. If you find an investment where if things go well, you'll make 30%, and if things go poorly, you'll lose 30%, it, you know, it's it's not a great thing. We're looking for this asymmetry. And, uh, and, and leverage does not produce an asymmetry. It produces an absolute symmetry. It magnifies the gains if you win and the losses if you lose. But there's one other aspect which is not symmetrical, which is it reduces the likelihood that you can get through tough times. So there can, if, if, if there's a downward fluctuation, an unlevered portfolio will make it through, a levered portfolio may not. So I think that you know, leverage is far from a, a, a magic solution. Um, and most of the, uh, most of the real uh, challenges in economic history have come from people who overestimated their ability to live through bad times with a leverage structure. So live by the sword, die by the sword. Exactly. And in fact, if you think about it, leverage is an example, Chris, in investing, everything is a two-edged sword, except for alpha. If, you, if, if, if an individual really has alpha, which, is, which I define as a superior skill and insight, that then that'll help you in good times and bad, but but the other things in it, like leverage, like concentration, as opposed to diversification, uh, and uh, these are these are two-edged swords. They they help you if the outcomes are good, but they hurt you if the outcomes are bad. Yeah, agreed.